All right, one of the things we're going to be talking about over the next few days is um, um, James Monroe and things that happened during his presidency after the War of 1812, which we just got done talking about. One of his biggest things, as you can see on the screen right here, foreign policy, how to deal with foreign nations after, once again, we've been drawn into a foreign war with Great Britain and what we need to change, what we need to do to change that. All right, let's uh, start off with a quick review um, with causes and effects of the War of 1812. So on the left, you see causes. Um, impressment of American sailors. I think by now we all know what impressment means. Interference with American shipping and uh, taxing, um, taxing American cargo, even though it's not going back and forth from Great Britain to America. Also, like we said, impressment, basically kidnapping American sailors and forcing them to work for the British military. Another big one was that helped cause the uh, War of 1812 was um, the British military giving aid to Native Americans. Remember, I told you Americans were moving on to Native lands and the, uh, the tribes were fighting them like the Shawnee with T Tecumseh and the British were helping them giving uh, aid in, form of, in the form of weapons. Okay, effects. Effects means what came afterward. After the war, an increased sense of national pride. Hey, big bad Britain, most powerful military in the world. We stood toe to toe with them for the second time in 30 years. So we feel kind of good about ourselves. And um, we may be on par with Great Britain in terms of military might and strength as a country. All right, American manufacturing boosted. So to kind of shift some of our economics onto our own, own soil, let's rely less on trade and more on making things here in America. Also, uh, Native American resistance weakened. As I told you guys, the, uh, <clears throat> the Native Americans got into several skirmishes about the United States citizens moving onto their land and um, uh, the US military was able to defeat them in, in a lot of ways and a lot of battles and also take over basically some of the land uh, that belonged to Native Americans. Okay, first let's start out by defining it. What is foreign policy? Foreign policy is our government strategy in dealing with other nations. So how we're gonna deal with primarily uh, Great Britain and France and Spain and the big European powers. Um, uh, basically by trying to stay out of their affairs and remain neutral and not get drawn into another war. That's like the big overarching point. Um, the adams onis Treaty. Uh, that is a treaty between the United States and Spain. What did it do? The United States received Florida from Spain, the land that is uh, now Florida from Spain, for $5 million and also for the, uh, for the USA's claim to Texas. So um, basically we got Florida from Spain and um, we gave over most of the land that is now Texas to Spain. That became Spanish territory. Um, this treaty also set the Red River as the border between Spanish territory and the U.S. So right now the border, uh, the Red River, is the border between Oklahoma and Texas. But back then, this is uh, in the early 1800s. Remember, the War of 1812 ended in 1815. So let's think, you know, in that time period. So for a visual, let me show you... Uh, um, what the adams onis Treaty did um, on uh, what is now U.S. territory. So here's a map, of course, United States, Canada, Mexico, right? Um, so this red line is the new boundary after the treaty. So we made a treaty. We give you $5 million. You give us Spain. So now Spain, it makes sense looking at the map. This is the United States at the time. This used to be Spanish territory. We'll buy that off of you for $5 million with this treaty. Um, both sides agree. We signed the treaty. But also, everything beneath this red line, south of this red line, became Spanish territory. So, um, 
So you can kind of see the outline. This would be the outline of Oklahoma today, and this would be Texas, right? So all of this land is now Spanish territory. So that is the Adams Onis Treaty uh, that changed some um, uh, land holdings in America uh, between the United States. We got Florida and France. They got Texas, essentially. Okay, more on foreign policy, not just um, the um, trading or buying or making uh, treaties or agreements over land with foreign countries to set our boundaries better. But um, James Monroe, the president, um, put forth something called the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, now, what is a doctrine? Let's pause this for a second and go to our dictionary.com. So a doctrine is a particular principle, position, or policy taught or advocated as of a religion or government. Like they said, Catholic do do uh, doctrines is religion, but the Monroe Doctrine. That means that that's uh, the position that the Monroe administration, his presidential administration, is going to um, take toward foreign nations. So uh, a policy he puts out to say, this is how we're going to deal with foreign nations. Okay, let's go back to our show here. So uh, this is U.S. policy in the Western Hemisphere. Hopefully you guys from last year and this year know Eastern from Western Hemisphere. The Western Hemisphere is North America, South America, Central America. The Eastern Hemisphere is across the Atlantic with uh, Europe and Africa and Asia, right? Just draw a line down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, um, so how are we going to deal with foreign, mainly European uh, powers like France and Spain and Great Britain? The first thing in the doctrine if my clicker will work. Oh. Hey, there we go. First thing. The U.S. would not interfere in the affairs of European nations, meaning we stay neutral. Because of France and England's war in the War of 1812, we got drawn into that. We're going to let them fight it out and remain neutral, not use our time or American lives or money to, uh, to fight wars or interfere in the uh, trade battles or anything in Europe. So if France and Spain have a problem or England and Spain have a problem, you guys have to figure it out. The U.S. will not interfere uh, in any way. The U.S. would recognize and not interfere with European colonies that already existed in North and South America. So one European colony in North America, you guys remember, is uh, um, Great Britain had what is now Canada. So we are not going to try to take that colony away from Great Britain. We're not going to try to move Great Britain out of Canada. We're going to recognize that that is your territory. There is a border, um, and, but we're not going to interfere with it. We're not going to try and take that land away from you or get you out of there. You can have that land. It's established, and we recognize it, and we recognize the border between our two, um, our two um, nations. Um, okay, this is an important one. Number three, pay special attention to this one. The Western Hemisphere, uh, like the United States and South America, Central America, Canada, was off limits to future colonization by any foreign power. So if England, they said, we had the 13 colonies before, we want to start colonies on the West Coast of the United States. Um, that is off, li off limits. And if you try and start a colony anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, North America, South America, Central America, then there is going to be trouble. We are drawing a line in the sand. You cannot start any colonies to extract resources um, anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, basically on the Western side of a, of a world map that you would see, like the one I have on my wall in the classroom. Okay, so the U.S. would consider any European nation's attempt to colonize in the Western Hemisphere to be a hostile act. And you all know what hostile means. That means uh, violence is going to happen if you try and start a colony. So if Britain goes to South America and in Brazil they discover gold and say, let's set up a colony to get gold, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be fighting. 
and uh, we'll defend it um, with our lives if necessary. So to reiterate, uh, no interference in the affairs of European nations. We recognize that yes, there are some colonies that are in North and South America that we won't uh, interfere with. We'll just recognize that they're there and that is fine for now, but no more. Um, the Western uh, Hemisphere would be off limits to future colonization by any foreign power. And the U.S. would consider any European nation's attempt to colonize in the Western Hemisphere to be a hostile act. And meaning we'll meet your hostility with more hostility. Okay, here is the most famous, uh, uh, one of the most famous cartoons, political cartoons uh, ever. And it is the Monroe Doctrine political cartoon. We're going to do some political cartoons soon. So I'm just going to briefly go over some things that make a good political cartoon uh, with you guys. So what do we see? Let's take a look at this. First thing we see is like this big guy here, right? Who does this represent? Uncle Sam, stars and stripes, right? Stars on the shirt, on the hat, stripes on the pants, stars and stripes. So that is the U.S. I like to tell my students every year, it represents the big, bad, big, bad, strong U.S., right? We are protecting all of the Western Hemisphere, North and South America, right? And how are we protecting it? With the Monroe Doctrine. And in political cartoons, you want to use size and scope, like look how big Uncle, Uncle Sam is as compared to the entire continents of North and South America, big enough to stand on both continents. Um, we say we will uh, consider you trying to colonize anywhere here a hostile act. This, uh, this bat or baton, what do you do with a baton? You beat people with it. So we will meet your, host your uh, hostility with force of our own. So this doctrine, we carry it like a, uh, like a baseball bat that we're willing to beat you with if you try and come over and colonize any part of North or South America. Um, let's see, what else do we notice about this? Um, look at the look on his face. Does it look friendly and welcoming? Like, come on over or uh, stay away from here or there will be trouble. Right, I'm going to have you guys make your own political cartoons um, <clears throat> maybe next week. And uh, um, you're going to have to think of things like that size, scope, what they mean. And we'll look at several, but this is like, uh, I like political car cartoons. I always have. This is one of my favorite ones. Like we're defending uh, the Western Hemisphere with force. Big, bad United States willing to use violence, knock you over the head. Excuse me, if you... Um, if you try and uh, encroach on our territory here in North or South America. So that is a political cartoon, I think a very clear and effective one. So what makes a political cartoon effective? Symbolism, using an object to stand for an idea. Um, let me go back really quick. So an object like a baseball back to stand for the doctrine or the idea about uh, protectionism, protecting uh, the Western Hemisphere. So using an object. Ideology, having a specific point of view. So uh, the Monroe Doctrine cartoon has a point of view that, um, um, do you think the author of that cartoon, sorry, I have to go back again, thinks this is a good idea or a bad idea? So the author, is he pro-Monroe Doctrine or anti-Monroe Doctrine? Probably pro. It makes the U.S. look strong and mighty, so big that they can stand on continents. So he has a point of view that this is a good idea. Whatever newspaper this appeared in, this author, uh, we can't really read his name, but he thought that this was a good idea. Symbolism, ideology. Um, third thing, size and scope. And I don't have to go back, making objects oversized or undersized. If you want to uh, make someone or something seem weak, like a president or a government, draw them really tiny and frail. If you want to make something seem strong, draw them big and oversized, like Uncle Sam 
on the Monroe Doctrine cartoon. Um, that's an important point, size and scope. Words and language, effectively using words to get a point across. Like sometimes you have thought bubbles or uh, dialogue, but in this, that had no thought bubble or dialogue. One of the things you saw was the words on the, uh, on the baseball bat looking object. Uh, Monroe Doctrine, clear as day. This is, uh, it shows violence and force, right? And uh, making, uh, and the artwork is important. Making drawings clear and easy to understand. So those five things will help make a um, political cartoon that you make and you're trying to get a point across. Doing these five things you see on the screen, symbolism, ideology, size and scope, words and language, and artwork, those will help you make an effective uh, political cartoon.